Hi everyone. Thanks for joining me today on the Divine Messages podcast. My name is Karina and I am a psychic medium out of Calgary, Alberta. Well, over the last few months, life has really been rather difficult. I had to put the podcast on hold as many other things as well. A few episodes ago, I had mentioned that my sister-in-law had passed away at the end of November. And then we had gone away for Christmas to Costa Rica, which ended up being a nice little lovely break. But when I got back a few weeks later, I was guided to go to Maui at the beginning of February, as I usually do for some healing. But this time, I was feeling really, really off, and I couldn't shake this odd feeling that something was going to happen, something bad. From the beginning of January, I was seeing 911 and 555 everywhere all day long. It was starting to make me quite frustrated, as it was overwhelming how much I was seeing it. I had this gut feeling that my father-in-law wasn't doing well, and the more that I would think about him, the stronger that feeling got. I had the same feeling before my sister-in-law passed, and sadly, I was right with her. So, of course, I was worried about my father-in-law. I had called him to check on him, and sure enough, he was sick. He had struggled with alcoholism for so many years of his life, and after losing his daughter in November, it really put him over the edge. I begged him to go to a hospital. I knew that he needed medical attention, but he was so stubborn. He brushed things off and flew from Halifax to Victoria to go back to work. He was a second engineer on a ship on the West Coast. I actually couldn't believe that he was going back to work because I knew how sick he was. And oddly enough, my husband had to fly to Victoria for a work meeting. He rarely ever has to do that in Canada. His work trips are mainly to the U.S., And when he told me that he had to go out there, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I knew he was being sent to him for a reason. When I was talking to my girlfriend, Pam, who has been on the podcast twice, she had told me that Nick's grandmother that had passed had been bugging her all day that day. She had said that Nick was being sent to see how sick his dad really was. Pam is one of my students, and she is so incredibly accurate in her readings for me, so I knew that she was also right on this one. Sadly, I think that my husband has been in somewhat of denial about his father's health for so long because my father-in-law managed to live for so many years through his addiction. And Nick would tell me that he was always on edge waiting for that phone call, but his dad just kept on living. Anyways, the week before I went to Maui, Nick flew to Victoria for his meeting. He had met with his father for dinner with his work peers and stayed the night with him at the hotel. Well, Right before they went to dinner, Nick called me and said, something's really wrong with Dad, and I told him to get him to the hospital, but of course, my father-in-law refused to go. He could be so stubborn. There was nothing Nick or I could do to get him the help that he needed, but I couldn't shake this terrible feeling. The night before I left for Maui, I had a panic attack in the middle of the night. I even thought about canceling my trip, but something made me get on that plane and go. Again, I had a feeling that my guides were sending me to Maui to gain some strength because I knew I was going to be dealing with something very heavy. I knew very well what that heavy was going to be, and I also tried to prep Nick for what I felt was coming, but I tried to relax and enjoy the healing powers of Hawaii as best as I could. And on the second night that I was there, I again woke up in the middle of the night to a panic attack. It was so bad that I even woke up my girlfriend that I was staying with and told her that something bad was going to happen. But what could I do at this point? I tried to get back to sleep, and I did eventually. But when I woke up in the morning, I had gotten a text from my father-in-law that he was in the hospital. I began texting with him back and forth. My gut feeling had been right. I tried to tell Nick that I was just going to fly home because I was worried that he may need me. But he kept telling me that I should just stay and that he was fine. And I ended up staying for the full five days, but the whole time I just couldn't relax at all. I had kept in close contact with my father-in-law and his doctors and knew he was worse than what he was saying. But at this point, the doctors didn't even have any results yet. So, the day that I flew home, I had told Nick that he should go fly to Victoria to be with him in the hospital, but he had said that he just couldn't do it. His fear had kicked in, and I believe he knew what was coming and didn't know how to handle it. And I mean, he had just lost his only sibling a few months ago, and now he had to deal with this. And so I told him that I was going to fly to be with him. He had been a father to me for over 26 years, and he needed someone to be by his side. 
so I washed some clothes, replaced my bag, and got on a flight to go to BC to be with them the next morning. I didn't even tell Alan that I was coming. I knew that if I did, he would tell me not to come. I walked into that hospital, and he looked completely shocked that I had shown up. And at first I felt that he was somewhat bothered that I was there, because he's the kind of man that would want to suffer alone and not have anyone take care of him. He had been there for four days having test after test being done, but hadn't gotten any results yet. I stayed with him until very late that first night and didn't want to leave him, but he was in the smallest room and there was just nowhere for me to sleep. And so I went to stay at my nephew's and fiancé's place for the night. They actually happened to live pretty close to the hospital. So then the next morning, I got up and went straight back to be with him. The doctor had finally come in and gave us the grim news. His liver had failed and his kidney was also struggling really badly. He had told us that the only way for him to survive would be to get a liver transplant, and that we needed to move to the other hospital where they had both a liver and kidney specialist. And when the doctor left the room, Alan looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, and said, I guess it is what it is. And in that moment, we both broke out in tears, hugged each other, cried for what seemed like an endless amount of time. And it was in that moment that I knew that he was very grateful that I was there with him. Later that day, he got moved to the other hospital, and I slept beside him for five nights. He had test after test done for a possible liver transplant. But sadly, in my heart, I knew that wasn't going to happen. I tried to keep things light with him. I brought him his favorite meals from restaurants nearby. Of course, the hospital food was so bad and he hated it, and I wanted to make sure that he was at least able to eat well. And we tried passing the time by having long conversations. We also, uh, we even balled up Kleenex and played basketball with it in between doctors and nurses coming in and out. We also had some pretty serious talks as well. He told me things like where his will was kept and where the keys to his filing cabinet were. I know both of us knew his fate, but we also wanted to hope for the best. His kidney started failing pretty badly, and he had to be put on dialysis. I was afraid to watch him struggle in pain. It all became a waiting game for the specialist to decide his fate of receiving a new liver. By the sixth day, I had to fly home. I had been gone for about 12 days in total between Maui and BC, and my family needed me. I was also needing to get back to teach a Reiki course that had been booked for months. And yes, of course, I mean, I could have canceled it, but I was guided to do it. We had made arrangements for my ex-mother-in-law to fly out to be with him the day after I left. They had actually stayed as good friends, and she wanted to be with them. I really struggled with leaving him behind, because I knew it was going to be the last time that I would see him. I even made sure to do a FaceTime call home to my boys so that they could tell him how much they loved him. I think they also knew that he wasn't going to make it. And so I hugged him really tight for one last time and walked out of that hospital room with the heaviest heart. When my mother-in-law arrived the next day, we stayed in touch all day long. She would text me his vitals and what the doctors were saying every chance she got. He was going downhill pretty fast. The doctors finally made their decision and denied their request for a liver transplant. He had been an alcoholic for over 30 years, and he had been warned not to drink for a couple of years, but he hadn't listened. They had told him that he had needed to stay sober for the next three to six months, and they would reevaluate him. But once he got that news, I believe his mindset changed. I think he just gave up. My mother-in-law had to leave and fly home as well, and we were both worried to leave him alone as he was getting worse. And Nick was going to try to fly there the next day, but the night that she left, he let go and passed. The doctor had called us in the middle of the night, and at first I thought she was calling to tell us that he was going downhill and that we should get there, but instead she was calling to tell us that he was gone. It was one o'clock in the morning, and we sat there for hours just sobbing. He was gone just like that. Two weeks in a hospital, and then all of a sudden, he was no longer here. The last few months have been so difficult for us in so many ways. Watching my husband lose two of the four of his family and seeing him struggle has been so hard. We have both been so mentally exhausted, all the while we have been both working nonstop. Life doesn't stop. We had to just keep on going and deal with it as best as we can. 
We had to fly across Canada to the East Coast last week to deal with all of his estate, and we did our best to make the most of the trip so that it wasn't too heavy. And we ended up having a lovely time because we got to visit and stay with some family, so that really helped to brighten our spirits. But I tell ya, life has truly beaten us down lately. Grief really is a crazy thing. One minute I'm so upset that both of our dads are gone, and then the next minute I'm angry at them for not being the grandfathers that I wish that they would have been for my boys. My father wasn't even in the picture. He had only met my oldest son three times, but he never even got to meet my youngest. So he missed out on two amazing little humans, and it's hard not to be angry sometimes. And then I go back and forth with love and anger for my father-in-law. He loved my kids so, so much, but he wasn't around for them. He was pretty self-absorbed within his own life. And when he did come for a visit, he was intoxicated the entire time. My children only knew him to be an alcoholic, a funny one, but an alcoholic nonetheless. He didn't have the proper time to really teach them anything or spend the proper time with them to guide them through their lives, and I understand very well that he was sick and had a disease, but it is hard not to be angry and upset. As a former addict myself, it makes me extremely frustrated that my kids will only remember him completely drunk at all times. He chose that path and wouldn't let me help him. I tried over and over again, and he would tell me that no one was going to tell him what to do. He would always say that he was going to do it his way and that we all needed to just back off. But as a healer, I wanted to help him so badly, but I was never able to. Instead, I watched him suffer in his last days while I sat there feeling completely helpless. Addiction doesn't just hurt the addict, it hurts everyone that loves them. That is a hard one to swallow. And so the grief is tricky. There are so many layers to it that need to be worked through, step by step, one day at a time. Alan really was more of a dad to me than my own father. We used to spend hours on the phone talking about everything, and I really trusted him. He was my biggest fan and told me that every single time that I talked to him. I could confide in him about everything, and I felt that he always had my back. And I'm upset because he left too soon. I needed him. We needed him. And even though I begged him to get help, he succumbed to the disease. So there it is, loving him so much, but being angry at him all at the same time. And I do forgive him for not being there for the boys the way that I wish that he could have. I mean, I know that he didn't neglect them on purpose, but all of it just hurts, you know? It is a very confusing time for sure. But one thing that I know that I must do is to keep helping people, because I know that's what he would want me to do. He told me that I was going to change the world, and that's what I'm going to try to achieve. These last few months have taught me a lot, not just about life, but about myself. I realize how important it is to live each day with purpose. I want to live a life that I'm proud of. I want to enjoy all that this crazy life has to offer, and I'm going to try my best to not sweat the small stuff. What a waste of time it is to worry and stress over the little things that may not even matter a year from now. So I've decided that I'm going to surround myself with people that only lift me up. I've decided that I'm going to keep clear boundaries with those that are trying to overstep. And I've decided that I'm going to do all of the things that bring me joy. We have a choice. We can choose to make each day count. We can love hard and live as if there is no tomorrow, and that is exactly what I'm going to try to do. I have work to do on this earth. We all do. If death doesn't teach us anything, I don't know what else will. I'm going to dedicate myself to my purpose like never before, because these losses have taught me to truly awaken and live. So I want to leave you all with this today. Grief and loss are going to be experienced differently by all of us, but the collective message remains the same. Live as if there is no tomorrow. Don't sweat the small stuff. Love harder than you ever have before. Let your past go. Forgive often. Push past fear. And lastly, just eat the damn cake. Live your life to the fullest. I want to thank you all so much for joining me today on the Divine Messages podcast. I am so glad to be back on here, and I will talk to you all next time.
Please bear in mind that the perspectives and opinions represented in this podcast are based solely on the divine messages, interpretations. We can in no way be held responsible for the actions of our followers.